The North Carolina Tar Heels men's basketball program has a rich history that most other schools around the nation could only dream of. Coach Pat Kilby and I have each prepared our list of the top 10 UNC basketball teams of all time. We're going to share it with you, and we got to figure out if this year's team could fit onto that list and where it would be. Let's get right into it. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Wednesday, September 7th, 2022. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and joining me as he does every Wednesday is the man, Coach Pack Kilby. We want to thank you for making Locked on Tar Heels your first listen or your first watch every single day. Don't forget that we are free and available anywhere you get podcasts, so go ahead and subscribe right now so that you get your team every day. Additionally, we'd like to thank LinkedIn Jobs for being the official college football recruiting sponsor across the Locked on College Network. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college terms and conditions apply. You guys, today, September 7th is two months to the day from the tip off of the first North Carolina men's basketball game on November 7th against UNC Wilmington. That is crazy pack. I can't believe it's coming. And so here's what I want to introduce you to is this idea of a drive for five. We are setting a goal here on Locked on Tar Heels of hitting 5,000 YouTube subscribers by that game. It is very attainable. It's very doable, but we need your help. As we record this podcast, we're just over 1,000 away from hitting that goal. And so here's what I want to ask you. Would you take a moment and subscribe? It literally just takes hitting a button. We're going to share links with you. Even those of you that only normally listen to the show, I'd ask that you join in and do this as well to help out. If you've got multiple Gmail accounts, do it from all of them. Why not? Nothing's going to hurt you. And Would you help us spread the word? Would you share the show with a Tar Heel fan that you know and love and ask them to join in and subscribing to and helping us hit this 5,000 mark by November 7th? Thanks for helping us with the drive for five. All right, Pat Kilby, here we go. Your top 10 UNC basketball teams of all time. And here's what I want to ask of you that are listening and watching. I want you to let Pac know what he gets right and where he goes horribly awry as he gives you his list. All right, Pac, <laughs> give it to us. I'm sure I'm going to be getting some heat here, but uh, I'm going to go from 10 down to one and I'm going to open up with the 1924 North yes. Carolina. Way back. Love it. Way back. But here's the deal, and this is why I went with them. 1924 to now, obviously, basketball's changed. The sport's way different. But, look, these guys deserve some credit. They started yeah. off the Tar Heel tradition. Um, they had uh, Cartwright Carmichael, which is part of the namesake of Carmichael Auditorium, UNC's first-ever All-American, 26-0, first national championship. I'm going to give them some love coming in at number 10. Yes. Number nine. 1983-84 UNC Tar Heels, coached by Mr. Dean Smith. These guys were 28 and three on the season. Um, notable players on this team. You ready for this roster right here? Oh my word! Give it to me. They've got MJ, Sam Perkins, Brad Doherty, Matt Doherty, Kenny Smith, Buzz Peterson. Those are some notable names on that roster. Ridiculous. That team. I mean, if you really break it down. You know, you can take away um, Jimmy Black and James Worthy, but for the most part, that's a lot of the core pieces that were on the 1982 national championship team. And this team went 28 and three. They were obviously really good, and they were upset in the second round of the NCAA tournament. So they don't necessarily have that luxurious resume, but this team was stacked with talent, and they were really good. And they obviously had a pretty good coach too. Um, <laughs> so number eight. Now, this is where I'm worried the Tar Heel Nation is going to just run me out of town. Number eight, 2017 national champion, North Carolina Tar Heels. 33-7 and seven regular season re- – or uh, overall record, 14-4 and four ACC record. Uh, this is obviously the redemption team. Uh, they have the infamous Luke May win um, over Kentucky in the NCAA tournament. Uh, those guys started the season super hot with that win over – um, over the the win of the, uh, the Maui Invitational, uh, they played really well right out of the gate. 
and uh, they were just really good. But here's the deal, and this is what I have on number eight. Um, this this team is missing two key pieces that I love, and I know that Target Nation does too, Bryce Johnson and Marcus Page. And that's why I have 2016 as number seven. Oh, back to back. I love it. That's right. Yeah, it's virtually the same team, but we had two really good players in Bryce Johnson and Marcus Page. And I know they don't have the national championship that the 2017 team does, but I would be willing to bet that the 2016 team is better because of those two that weren't there. Um, they just happened to obviously run into uh, Villanova in the finals and Marcus Page hit the shot that we all thought was going to take it to overtime and win us a national championship. But uh, we're not going to talk about that other shot. We're just going to say the 2016 team was awesome. We love them. And I'm going to show them some love by having them at number seven. <laughs> number six, 1993 national champions. Eric Montross, George Lynch, Donald Williams. Man, he's underrated. Good player. Yes. Brian Reese, Derek Phelps, Pat Sullivan, current Tar Heels basketball defensive coordinator, Scott Cherry, and Dante Calabria. 33 and 4 record, 14 and 2 in the ACC, first, uh, first place in ACC regular season. Uh, beat Roy Williams in the final four. This is a little note about that season. <laughs> uh, then they turned right around and beat the Fab Five in the national title with the, the big timer out there. Uh, this team, I really want to point out, was kind of like the first of the mold that kind of Roy Williams has stuck to, right? They had mm-hmm. the, they had a really good, strong post play in Montrose. They had the lockdown defender and well, really they had two, George Lynch and Derek Phelps. Those oh, two yeah. were really good, but they had good defense there. Um, and then, you know, they had just well-balanced offense. I think they had four players that were within between 13 and 15 points per game. So uh, that's just a really, really well balanced team. All right, number five. Yep, three of them. 1997, 1998, North Carolina Tar Heels. This team, guys, is the best team that has never won a national championship. The best team in college basketball history to never win a national championship. I will hang my hat on that all day long. 34 and four record. 13-3 Thirteen and three in the ACC uh, conference tournament champions, a Final Four loss to uh, the famous coach Rick Majerus and the Utah Utes. Um, you know this was this team featured Antoine Jameson, Vince Carter, Shimon Williams, Ed Coda, Adamola Okalaja, uh, Mokhtar and Dye, just some really really good players. And I have my own theory about this team. And look. Coach Guthridge is amazing. He's awesome. He's a Tar Heel through and through. Uh, but what I will say is I feel like Dean Smith kind of hand-wrapped this for him, and he decided when he was going to step down purposefully so that he could set Guthridge up for some success. And, look, I'm not blaming it on Guthridge, but mm. I'm just saying if this team has Dean Smith, I think we bring home the natty. I'll I think leave. you're right. I think you're right on that, fact. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that that would have been what put us over the edge. But nonetheless, a great, very talented team, best team to never win a national championship, in my opinion. Number four, the Lenny Rosenbluth-led 1957 Let's go. 14-0 in ACC play, conference tournament champions, and national national champions. Now, here's what I want to point out about this. This is really cool. A three-overtime win against Kansas – in the national championship, 54 to 53, lockdown defense right there. Kansas, <laughs> hey, Kansas had Wilt Chamberlain at that time, and this is nuts. Wilt averaged 29.6 points per game that season and 18.9 rebounds. And Carolina goes in there and goes toe-to-toe, wins the national championship. On the shoulders of our man Lenny Rosenbluth, 28 points per game, nine rebounds per game. And then his sidekick, Pete Brannon, was 15 points per game and 10.4 rebounds per game. So those two right there led the 1957 team to the national championship. Crazy. All right, final three, the toughest three, the absolutely toughest three to decide from. Uh, But number three is the 1982 North Carolina Tar Heels. MJ, Worthy, Perkins, 
Matt Doherty, Jimmy Black, Buzz Peterson, you name it. This team was really, really good. Um, 32 and two on the season, 12 and two ACC play, which was first uh, good for first in, in regular season. Conference tournament champions, national champions. Check this out right here, though. This is really cool. I actually didn't know this until today. Final four W over Houston, right? That kind of gets overlooked because of the Georgetown game. That team fish, uh, that team that Houston put on the court had Clyde Drexler, Hakeem Olajuwon, and Rob Williams. Now, is that three really good players? Ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. And Carolina beats them in the final four and then turns around and beats the Patrick Ewing and Sleepy Floyd led Georgetown Hoyas, which was the shot that basically made MJ be known, right? That was his coming out party. And uh, so. Special team right there, um, and Dean Smith's first national championship. So, um, number two, guys, I'm not gonna lie, this was hard because I I flopped these these last two a lot. Okay, but uh, this is what I ended up going with: 05 at number two, 2005 team at number two, Raymond Felton, Shad McCants, Jackie Manuel, Jawad Williams, Marvin Williams, Melvin Scott. David Noel, Wes Miller, and uh, maybe this guy named uh, Sean May. So he was all right. He, well, he was all right. <laughs> uh, but real quick on this team 33 and 4, 14 and 2 in ACC play, which was regular season champs, national champs. They defeated a really good Illinois team in the national championship. That team was good. And uh, I, in my opinion, this team, this 05 team, was the best coaching job that Roy ever did when he was the head coach at North Carolina. You know, that team before he got there was struggling. Um, Then he takes them to the NIT, and then all of a sudden they go from NIT to national champs. Like, that's a really good, a really good coaching job. And the way he developed those guys was was just awesome. Six draft picks on that team. Uh, Marvin Williams went second overall. Felton went fifth. May went 13th. And McCants went 14th, all in the first round, which was at that time the most a school had ever had taken in the lottery. So it was a really good showing. But what stands out to me about this team, I just wanted to point this out real quick because I thought it was awesome. Uh, Jim Nance, after Carolina wins the national championship, which I was a young, I was young at this time, and I love Sean May. He had this quote at the end. The road begins in March. The winner is crowned in April, but the night belongs to May. <laughs> How cool is that? How cool is That's that? so good. I don't think I've ever heard that. I missed that yeah. somehow. Man, I'll never forget that because that was like I was just sitting there going, "This is awesome." Sean Bay still my favorite player of all time. Uh, and then number one, I think it goes without saying, y'all probably know, but 2009 Tar Heels um, just dominant in every phase of the game, and um, obviously 34 and four regular season, or sorry, overall record 13 and three ACC regular season champs. Um, Twenty point one points was the margin of victory that they averaged in the NCAA tournament. That's ridiculous. That is just absurd. Like all these other national championship teams there, they had some nail biters and some close close wins. This team just waxed people. Um, to me, Ty Lawson's the best point guard in the Roy Williams era hmm. and potentially maybe the best, my, at least in my opinion, the best point guard Carolina's had, uh, maybe other than Ed Cota and Phil Ford. <laughs> Let's make sure we get Phil Ford's name in yeah, there. Yeah, yes, one hundred percent. Underrated lockdown defense from Danny Green, shooting galore from Wayne Ellington, and then you have the most decorated player in NCAA history, and that's Tyler Hansbrough. This team was really good. They were Maui Invitational champs, regular season twenty point win over Kentucky, thirty five point win against Michigan State in the ACC Big Ten Challenge. Just dominant from from start to finish. These guys were really good, and in my opinion, the best team in Carolina history. Okay, folks, there you go. There's Pac's list. I can't wait to read the comments, uh, how you're just lighting them up or agreeing with them. Uh, Listen, Pac, I think there's a lot of good in there, and you're going to hear a lot of the same team names when I give my list in just a second, right after I tell you a little bit about LinkedIn. As you gear up for fall, you need the right people on your team to help your small business fire on all cylinders. 
LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free. Create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Then add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring so your network can help you find the right people for you. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know that every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Again, that's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Okay, Pack, we all just heard your list. I'd like to give you mine. Same thing. Let me know where I got it right and when I went horribly wrong. Um, as you heard, unfortunately, there's not a ton of time for us in a 30 minute uh, podcast to be able to give you a lot of in depth on these. And so I'll, I'll skate by some of it. Um, here's the way I approached it. I wanted to make sure, like I love that Pac went all the way back to the 20s. I wanted to make sure that I was getting a good breadth uh, of North Carolina about history. So what I did was back to the 50s, that 56, 57 team. And I said, that's the first like uh, legit tournament championship. And so I got to give at least one team from all of the seven completed decades from the 50s up through today, obviously not the 20s because it's not completed, but the 50s up through the 2010s, I have at least one team from each decade and then three at largest because that's seven decades. So that's kind of how I approached it to help me make some sense of this whole top 10. So uh, my number 10 team is my lone example from the 2010s. I didn't give a 16 or 17 thought about it. I actually thought the 2011-12 team was the best Carolina team of the 2010s. Um, man, they lost in the Elite Eight, but you will never convince me that they would not have been national championships if stinking Ethan Rogge from Creighton hadn't broken Kendall Marshall's wrist. Also, uh, keep in mind, John Henson was banged up from the ACC tournament. And uh, man, I really think Carolina and Kentucky were on a collision course to meet again. Remember, Kentucky had barely squeaked out a victory earlier in the year. I really think that North Carolina team wouldn't be 10th on this list if Kendall Marshall's wrist wasn't broken. They would be much higher because they would have been your national champs. I'm sticking to that till I die. Ninth on my list, one of several teams from the 90s is, is the decade I actually wound up with the most teams from. This is the 94-95 team. Made it to the final four 28 and six overall, 12 and four in the ACC, tied for first. You got five double digit scores. You got some holdovers from the 93 championship team and then some of these young bucks. And so that's why I chose this one because of that final four and that blending of talent. You got Jerry Stackhouse, Rasheed Wallace, Donald Williams, Jeff McInnes, a young Dante Calabria. Um, pretty cool. Peace Lake. Pierce Landry, Rob's dad was on this team. Pat Sullivan, who Pat talked about earlier, is on this team. Ed Geth, whose son is committed to play football at Carolina, is on this team. Young Shimon Williams is on this team. I mean, just ridiculous. You've got the eventual third and fourth overall picks in the NBA draft in Stackhouse and Rasheed Wallace. Phenomenal, phenomenal team, the 94-95 Tar Heels. Next for me, number eight on my list, this is my entry from the 70s, is the 76-77 team who lost to Marquette in the national championship game. This was Coach Smith's second shot at a national championship. You got Phil Ford, Walter Davis, Tommy Lagarde, Michael Corrin, all four averaging double digits. Phil Ford, let me just give you his stats from that year. 18.7 points per game, 53.4% shooting, 85.3 from the free throw line, 6.58 assists a game, 1.73 steals a game. This dude was insane. That's my number, 18 they were 28 and 5, 9 and 3 in the ACC, first in the conference, but their losses one point to Wake in overtime, two points at NC State, one point versus Wake Forest. They lost to Clemson and then the national championship. So barely had losses, but they did. Number seven on my list is my entry from the 60s. This is another NCAA runner up team, the 1967 68 Tar Heels. This was Coach Smith's 
first title or first shot at a national title in his seventh year coaching the Tar Heels. They lost to who else? UCLA. Of course, they lost to UCLA in the 60s because that's what everyone did. Similar, this team was 28 and four overall. Their only losses were at number eight, Vandy, a one point loss to South Carolina, a one point loss in triple overtime at number 10, Duke, and then the national championship loss. Won the ACC. I also picked this team because it was the middle of a three-year run of going to the Final Four every year. Uh, You got Larry Miller, you got Charlie Scott, Rusty Clark, just a bunch of dudes. Excuse me. Coming in at sixth on my list is a team that Pat had. This is where we first overlap a little bit, the 97-98 team. Uh, That Saturday losing to Utah was one of the most heartbreaking. Like, I just thought this was a team of destiny. I'm with Pac. Probably... I don't, I probably would go as far as Pac to say this was the best team in NCAA history to not win a championship, but it's just so good. Vince Carter, Antoine, Automatic uh, Okolaja, and, and Shimon Williams, and Ed Co- I mean, just insane what this team had. And uh, I, I still not cannot believe they lost that game. My number five team is the 92-93 Tar Heels. Pac's already talked about them. Coach Smith's first national championship. Um just huge for him to finally get there. I really am. Or I'm sorry. His second national championship. Hang on. Don't blow me up. What am I saying? Uh, his second national championship team here, the 93 Tar Heels with Montrose, the whole crew that Pac already talked about. Uh, what a great run. And uh, of course, the, the iconic game knocking off Michigan. They should have already had. They didn't need the technical timeout. They should have got the ball when Chris Weber traveled, but it wasn't tall. <laughs> what on earth are we doing there? Now, we get into the top four teams, and interestingly, we have the exact same top four teams, Pac, uh, just in slightly a little bit different order. Our number four team is the exact same, the 56-57 Tar Heels, undefeated national champions, 32-0 overall, 14-0 in the ACC. Our guy Rosenbluth, man, 28 points a game, 8.8 rebounds, the National Player of the Year for the Helms Foundation ACC Player of the Year. Got all these dudes, Pete Brennan, Tommy Kearns, Joe Quigg, Bob Cunningham. As you already said, those two crazy games in the final four, triple overtime in back-to-back nights. Keep in mind at this point, uh, the semifinal and the championship weren't played a day apart. So you're playing triple overtime, back-to-back nights, a 74-70 victory in the semifinal, and then a 54-53 victory that you already talked about in the championship game. Absolutely ridiculous. Next for me, and this is where our order gets a little bit different, is Coach Williams' first national championship team, the 04-05 Tar Heels. Uh, Man, everything Pac said right there, just an unbelievable run that year. Obviously, they had that odd loss uh, early in the season to Santa Clara, but there was some personnel things there. Um, You're you're missing Ray Felton, if I remember correctly, and so um, that that obviously contributed to that in a major way. I I love a season where you actually get the legit best two teams in the nation in the national championship game, and I think part of why I love this team is I feel like everyone said Carolina is the most talented but Illinois is the best team, and the Tar Heels just went out and proved that wrong. As Pac said, Coach Coach Williams took this team and just very quickly turned this phenomenal talent into his first national championship team. All right. My number two team and my number one team. I really, really debated on this, but I have uh, two big reasons why I chose the order I did. Number two for me is 81-82. And I know that for a ton, a ton, a ton of people, this is actually the best North Carolina team to them. The collection of talent, it's Coach Smith's first national championship, despite what I said a second ago about 92, 93. Uh, All the guys that Pac already talked about, not only did they beat Hakeem, not only did they beat uh, Patrick Ewing, they beat Ralph Sampson in the ACC championship. I mean, just all this ridiculous stuff they did. Um, 12 players on that team were ultimately drafted somewhere in the NBA draft. Of course, then the NBA draft was bigger. Um, so that's part of it, but you had James Worthy, number one, overall Jordan was inexplicably number three overall and Sam Perkins, number four overall. So this team had four overall top, top four overall draft picks on it. I mean, just absurd. Now, part of why I dinged them is because they had a less dominant NCAA tournament run than my number one team. 
Um, there were only five games in the NCAA tournament for at, at that point instead of six, just by the number of teams. But their their winning margins were two, five, ten, five, and one. So just one double digit win. And now I know these teams that they're playing were just absolutely ridiculous with the players we've already talked about. But that's why I dinged them a little bit. And ultimately, pardon me, why I chose the 2008 2009 Tar Heels also as my number one team pack. Look at us coming in at the same way because, folks, Pack and I did not share our list with each other before we did this. And so crazy. So ultimately, I chose them over 81-82 for two reasons. Number one, the March Madness dominance. As Pac already talked about, double-digit victories in all six games. And also, this is my list, and I'm choosing who I want, and this is the team that I had the greatest personal connection to. You said Sean May was your favorite Tar Heel. Tyler Hansborough is mine. Just, I love the way this dude plays the game. It's not pretty all the time, but man, it works. And people hate him on other teams and you love him to be on your team. But the combination of just his just kind of way of playing with the beautiful shot of Wayne Ellington, everything that Ty Lawson did, I'm with you. The dude just got out and ran. Um, and keep in mind, they did all this with Tyler Hansborough injured at the beginning of the year and Tyler uh, Ty Lawson injured at the beginning of the NCAA tournament and still did everything they did there. And man, so just this is my number one team and I can't wait to hear all the reactions to it, positive and negative. But Pac, here's where we need to go now. Um uh, let's say some things about where we think each other got things right and wrong. But first, I want to try to figure out, uh, we actually started the idea of this exercise because I believe it was you that said to me first, Isaac, where do you think the 2022-23 Tar Heels are going to fit in in the history books of North Carolina basketball? And so I'm curious to hear you, Pac, where do you think this year's team fits into the grand scheme of North Carolina basketball history? Well, it all depends really to me on just how dominant for one that they are and number two just if they actually bring home the trophy to chapel hill right so those are the two big question marks if they bring that trophy home even in a non-dominant fashion to me they crack the top 10 probably somewhere like number nine or number 10. If they do it in a dominant fashion, they could climb as high as probably number five to me, uh, just to be honest with you. Number one, I personally relate really well to this team. Like, to me, I find it easy, easy to like them. Uh, Armando, obviously, is just like Tar Heel through and through. And I love Armando, and I love watching him play. And he battles for Carolina, as we saw, you know, on, on the biggest stage, Um our guard play, RJ and Caleb, man, is really, really good. And they're veteran now. They're juniors. And uh, Leakey is obviously somebody that I love and have loved for the last five years. And he just – he reminds me so much of Jack Emanuel, which mm. brings me back to the 05 team, right? So, to me, I relate well to them. I think they've got a chance to be really, really good, especially with how veteran they are. Um, they're all likable. Love Coach Davis. It would be his first national championship. And then I think about, too, for the most part, you know, minus Brady Manick and, you know, Kerwin Walton, um, Anthony Harris, we had the same team. So you're looking at a team that went to the Final Four, beat Duke, played in the national championship, and then they came back and, they're, you know, they won, won it all, if that's the case. Uh, to me, that could get them as high as number five. Man. What are your and, thoughts? I – as I've processed it, I would not have them in my top 10 right now. And it's funny, I, as I've thought more about it throughout the week, like I feel like when you first texted me about this, you said, am I crazy that it, that I think this team would be in the top 10? I think I said yes or something like that. <laughs> because, you know, a lot of times with recency bias, you end up um, making a team higher than they otherwise would be historically. I think a recency bias has caused me to put them lower than I think history might tell us they were. And here's what I mean by that. Based on the, the struggles of two years ago, um, and then the struggles of the beginning of last season, I think I've perhaps not fully appreciated the talent and capability of this team. And so it took last year's 
um, last third of the season run to start moving them up. And so for me, I think this is a prove it year in a big way, because in some ways, when you start thinking about it, it's similar to the 0405 team, right? It's this team that had uber amounts of talent, but hadn't been able to prove it perhaps because of coach Doherty or whatever it is. And it took the right guy in coach Williams to make it happen. And so I'm really curious. I, I think, as you said, it's going to depend a lot on what this year looks like. Can this team come in and do what they did for the last third of last year? Or if so, then yeah, they're probably going to rise in the history books for me. But as of right now, it's a prove it year for me to show me that they belong in the top 10 in North Carolina history. And so I'm not ready to move them into that uh, above any of these teams yet. Like as I 10th team on my list was 11, 12. Right now, I don't see this team as better than that team, but Depending on, like you said, if this is a dominant year and they they finish the regular season, um, you know, with two, three losses and then finish it off with a national championship, I don't see how I would keep them out of my top 10, just like you're saying. So we're disagreeing on that for now, and I can't wait to see uh, what happens with it as the season unfolds. <laughs> Going back to our top 10 list, I, I took a couple notes um, on things. I think I am probably a little bit too low on the 97, 98 team. I had them sixth. I think you had them fourth or fifth. And I, th I think that's right. Um, I, I probably favored national championship winning teams a little more, but I, I, I think just based on talent and who that team was and what they had, I should have moved them up. Um, I think my biggest point of disagreement on your list would be the 16 and 17 teams. I, other than what you said, I completely agree. I think the 16 team was a better team than the 17 team, but I think the nation wasn't as good in 17. And that team was just so hungry that that's what propelled them to that championship. Um, but I, I, that's probably my biggest point of disagreement with your list. Yeah. Yeah. And that's fair. I actually thought about that a lot. I kind of weighed those like, man, you know, what do I do with this? But that yeah. national championship does kind of. It holds a lot of weight. It. Yep. It does. So I, I definitely can see that. Where I thought that maybe I could have done better was the 11-12 team. I think that they're a top 10 team. Yeah. But what I kind of did was I kinda, I just value that 19-24. I know yep. there wasn't really a tournament, but to me that was just kind of like the start of the Tar Heels era. So I wanted to show them some love. Steak. Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. But in all reality, I mean, 11, 12 is, is a better basketball team than that. So um, I also really like the, the 68 and the 77 edition, you know, on your list. As a Tar Heels fan, I can honestly say I think the 70s is probably maybe the most overlooked era in Carolina mm. basketball. Yeah. And so, and that's Phil Ford, right? So, <laughs> we kind of, you know, we miss out on some of that or overlook some of that. And uh, because they never, because no championships, I think is right. a big part of that, right? <laughs> like if if what if that team beats Marquette, then then that's a national. Ch you know, like we would have those teams on all the lists. Yeah, for sure, for sure. But I wish I would have had them on there or thought of them, you know, to to maybe mention them in my honorable mention or whatever, because that's. That's a really good team that was left off the list. Yeah. Uh, something that's interesting to me is that neither of us picked 82 as the best team. We both had it in our top three. We had the same top four, in fact, and uh, the same top three. Uh, but I think a lot of people, just because of that collection of Jordan Worthy and Perkins, and then the pieces around it would just be like, that's it. That's the team. Yeah. Um, the coach, And in addition to it being Coach Smith's first championship, I think there's just a lot there. Um, yes. That would lead up most uh, people and some of it's going to be generational, right? Um, us being both being a little bit younger guys, I think probably is part of why we favor some of these nineties and two thousands teams. So hand up. I recognize that bias, um, but I, I have no qualms with anybody who picks the 82 national championships. Number one on this list. I definitely think it has something to do with age. I think, you know, if I were to, to ask my dad right now, who's a diehard Tar Heels fan, he would say 81, 82, hands down, without question. But that's kind of what he grew up on. And that was, you know, obviously he – my dad will swear Dean Smith is the GOAT, right? <laughs> Whereas I'm like, oh, no, it's Roy Williams. But uh, it, it largely depends on the area you grow up in and just kind of what you relate to better. And, and, and so 
there's not a wrong answer. You know, 81, 82 is amazing, but so is 05 and so is 09. And it's, it's hard to discern <laughs> which one of those is actually better. I wish we could just have all those players back in the Target uniform. Right. And we could just find out, right? Absolutely. And, and Pac, I think that's the beautiful thing of this whole conversation is we are spoiled as Carolina people, right? Um, who there there's the possibility to have all these conversations. Some, some programs are trying to pick their number one team. And it's like, oh man, that's that one final four team that we had that one time. And I, I think that's what makes this exercise so difficult for North Carolina is there's just been so many successful teams for so many decades. And that just makes this exercise difficult to be a North Carolina Tar Heel, but what a great and wonderful problem to have. And it's looking, as we've been talking about, like we might add yet another chapter to that difficult and wonderful history coming up this season. So friends, uh, cannot wait to read your comments here on what your thoughts are. Uh, man, it should be wild and wacky. Please don't forget our drive for five. Subscribe to Locked on Tar Heels on YouTube. Help us get to 5,000 before November 7th. Can't wait to see how that blows up. Coming up tomorrow, Georgia State beat writer Ben Moore joins me to talk about the upcoming game this weekend. Uh, cool tidbit, Ben Moore and I are from the same high school. Pretty neat. Uh, if you want to follow the show on Twitter, you can do that at Locked on Heels. You can follow Pack at Coach underscore K23 and follow me at Isaac Shade. Now for your second listen, go check out the Ultimate Pro Football Preview, an eight-episode extravaganza to get you ready for the 2022 NFL season. The local team experts of the Locked On Podcast Network and Odyssey NFL Insiders all combining into one Ultimate NFL Preview. Search for Ultimate Pro Football Preview 2022 on your Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get podcasts. Thanks so much for spending part of your Wednesday hanging out with us. We want to see your top 10 lists. Share it with us. And remember, it's always a great day to be at Tar Heel. Until tomorrow, peace.